Paul is sharing with them his prayer for them. He prayed that God would grant them to be strengthened with might or dunamis by his spirit in the inner man that they might experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. And as we mentioned last week, that word dwell is to just settle down and make himself at home. He might be comfortable at home in their hearts. The next petition that Paul has for them is that they being rooted and grounded in love. That their roots would go down deep in the love of Jesus Christ. It's through the roots that a plant or a tree draws its source of life. The moisture, nourishment, are drawn from the soil by the roots. He wants them to be nourished in the love of Jesus Christ. But the roots also have another function, and that is to stabilize or to anchor the tree or the plant. It could not stand without the roots. A plant would soon be blown away without roots. So he wants them to be stabilized. We draw from the love of Jesus Christ that sustaining power and stabilizing power. In the next chapter, Paul's going to make a reference to those who are carried about with every wind of doctrine and slight cunning of men. People who are not properly rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, who are not properly rooted and grounded in the Word of God, you see them carried away with every wind of doctrine that comes blowing through the church. They lack a real stability. The Stability that comes by being rooted in the Word of God and in the love of God. Jesus talked about the men who built their houses. One built his house upon the sand, the other dug deep, laid a foundation. And when the storms came, the house with a strong foundation stood. Paul's praying that God will give them a strong foundation grounded in this love of Jesus so that they will be able to withstand the storms that will come, that they won't be blown away with every wind of doctrine that comes breezing through the church. Rooted and grounded in love. Some 30 years later, after Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, Jesus himself wrote a letter to the Ephesians. John was commanded by Jesus to write unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. And as the Lord commended the church in Ephesus for those positive characteristics, their Works and their labor, their discernment. He then said, But I have this against thee, in that you have left your first love. It is possible that Paul saw, even at that time that he wrote, sort of a strain. It could be that their relationship with the Lord was becoming rather mechanical. And it's always sad when a relationship with the Lord becomes cold and mechanical. 
And it's possible that when Paul saw this, he recognized the need for them to just really be fully grounded in the love, rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. And so his prayer for them. Whenever God begins to zero in on an area in your life, it's important that we take heed. So oftentimes when the Lord gives us a warning, we feel that we really don't need it. That we are able to handle ourselves and able to handle the situations. And that we really don't need that warning from God. As we have said before, God is faithful. He always warns in advance of our getting into trouble. And here the prayer of Paul could have been just sort of a warning to them concerning the importance of their being rooted and grounded in love. If God wanted a mechanical relationship with you, he would have created you a robot. And probably gotten a lot more service out of you. <laughs> but he didn't want a mechanical relationship. He wanted a loving relationship. And he desires that your life be rooted and grounded in love. They say to be forewarned is to be forearmed. This is true if you heed the forewarning. Paul's prayer that they also be grounded in this love. Not just rooted, but also grounded in love. And love is the foundation upon which Christianity is built. In the previous petition, Paul is praying that they would be strengthened by his might, by the Spirit. And when God's Spirit is working in our lives, the truest manifestation of the Holy Spirit working in your life is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And though you may have other manifestations that may on the outside be more spectacular, draw more attention, if you don't have love, the other spiritual manifestations are meaningless. Christianity is grounded in love. Jesus said by this sign... Men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And without this love, all of my spiritual confessions and manifestations are really meaningless. And John tells us that the love shouldn't just be in word, in tongue. You know, there are a lot of people that know how to say the right things. And, and they say them with uh, what sounds to be great conviction. They know how to talk about that full surrender to Jesus Christ. How that their desire is only to be close to the Lord. And you hear them talk and you think, my, these people are so committed, so dedicated. But then you find out it's only verbal. They know how to talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And it's oftentimes very disappointing when you've heard a person sharing their commitment, their love, their devotion. And then when you see from their lives things that are inconsistent 
with what they've been verbalizing. Let's not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth, John said. And he said, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. That blessed assurance because of God's love that is working in my life. The reality of your Christian commitment is actually proved by your love. We know, John said, we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. First John, just sort of going through it, uh, looking at this subject of love. In chapter 3, verse 11, he says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is really the message that we have. The message from the beginning in 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. John 3.23 And this is His commandment that we we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. 4.7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 4.8, And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, then we ought also to love one another. And no man hath seen God in any time. And if we love one another, God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. Verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. And we love him because he first loved us. And if a man say, I love God and hates his brother... He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? 5.2 By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Going back to 4.21 And this commandment we have from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. In John 15, 17, Jesus said, These things I command you, that ye love one another. A new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you. So, uh, as you can readily see, love is the proof. It's the proof that I am born again. We know that we've passed from death into life. It's the proof to the world that we are the disciples of Jesus. By this sign shall men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And it is also the proof that I have the Spirit of God indwelling in me, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. The question is... Are we as a church being a witness to the world today that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ? When they look at us, when they come into our fellowship, do they feel the love of Christ working through our lives? You know, one of the drawbacks of a large church is that many times it's quite impersonal. 
Many times the loneliest times in your life is when, are when you are in a huge crowd and you don't know anybody there. And I'm afraid that sometimes we get our little groups, those that we are familiar with, those that we go out to get coffee with, and when we come to the church, they're the ones that we're looking for. That we might get together, sit together, maybe go out afterwards together. And I believe that many times we're so anxious just to see the ones that we know and to get into fellowship with them that quite often we just look right through or overlook those who are strangers, those who haven't come here before. Now, with a church this large, it is difficult because you can go up and say to someone, well, glad to see you. Are you new here? And they'll say, oh, no, I've been attending for 20 years, you know. <laughs> But I, I think it is important that we greet one another, that we smile when we meet another, and that we show a concern, that we acknowledge them. I, I love this fellow that's standing over on the side of the church over here. When you drive in, he's out there waving. I, I, I love that. Uh, I was thinking it would be great to have someone at every entrance. <laughs> Just greeting, you know. Remember the fellow down in Lars and Honey, or in Laguna Beach that used to be the greeter? You know, you love to drive through Laguna. Just to see that old guy out there waving at you, you know. <laughs> like he knew you. And you sort of felt, well, yeah, he knows me. And, and we need that kind of warmth and love to be emanating so that when someone comes in who are sort of searching, searching for God, not knowing if He really exists or not, but knowing there's an emptiness in their own heart and in their own life, and sort of reaching out to try to find it, something that would be meaningful. The most meaningful thing in the world is love. And oh, would to God that we would be rooted and grounded in love to the extent that when people came in, and especially strangers, the one characteristic that they would go away from the church, the, the one thing that would really stick in their minds is, well, I don't know, you know, that preacher may be lacking, but boy, those people really love each other. <laughs> That's what's important. If we don't have that love, then do we really have a right to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ? Because certainly he manifested compassion, caring, loving. Let's pray that God will root us and let the tentacles go deep in love. And may we use that as the foundation upon which we build. The next thing that Paul was praying for them is that they might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know that love of Christ which passes knowledge. Notice the breadth and the length. That's the horizontal, the breadth and the length. But then also the depth and the height, that's the vertical. 
And when you put the horizontal with the vertical, you've got the cross. And therein is where we really know the love of Christ. Manifested in that he gave himself for us. It's in the cross of Christ that we see manifested God's love. John 15, 13, Jesus said to his disciples, Greater love has no man than this, than a man will lay down his life for his friends. Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. It was the purpose of God in the divine counsels of God before the foundations of the world that God would demonstrate unto man supreme love, greatest love, God's love for man. He would demonstrate it and only seek to prove it in one action. And that is in the offering of his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Whenever God wants to assure you of his love, he always points to the cross. There was God's love manifested for us. There at the cross. How do I know that God loves me? I can look at the cross and I know he loves me. Satan likes to oftentimes, because of adverse circumstances, challenge God's love. If God loves you, then why is this happening to you? Why did God allow this? And, and he likes to challenge in our minds God's love for us through adverse circumstances that we might be facing. And whenever I'm prone to doubt, I always look back at the cross. And there my heart is assured, God loves me supremely. Greater love has no man than this, than a man will lay down his life for his friends. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, verse 2, Paul says, tells the believers, Now walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Again, pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ as the proof of God's love for us. Uh, in 1 John 4.10, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And of course, the classic John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So therein is God's love manifested. So Paul is praying that you might know the length and the breadth of God's love, the depth and the height of God's love. As we mentioned before, it is God's desire to bring you into a loving relationship with himself. And so he initiated this relationship by first loving you and demonstrating that love for you in the giving of his son to die for your sins. And so, Paul says, the love of Christ constrains me. It draws me. It binds me to him. Titus, Paul writing to Titus said, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient and deceived. And we were serving diverse lusts and pleasures 
living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We were once there. But, he said, that after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness, righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We once were there in that envy and hatred and striving, living after the flesh. But once having received the Spirit, now walking in the Spirit, our lives should be marked by love. Now, the word for love is that uh, Greek word agape. And it is a love that is deeper than physical love, even deeper than emotional love. A love that touches the area of the spirit of man. The Greeks had the word for the physical love, the eros, the phileo for the emotional love, but they had the agape for the spiritual love. And this is the word that Paul is using here in Ephesians chapter 3 when he talks about this rooted and grounded in this agape and to know the love, the agape of Christ. To know how much he loves you. And knowing how much he loves you, then we are drawn to love him. We love him because he first loved us. Oftentimes when I am talking to people who have come forward to receive Jesus Christ. I will tell them that there are three things that Jesus said that are very important to you at this point of your life. Number one, Jesus said, come unto me. All of you who labor and who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. So the first command is just come to me. The promise is, if you do, I will give you rest. So you have made your move. You've come. Now it's his move. I always like it when it's his move. Waiting now for him to move. I've made my move. I've, I've done what he said I should do. Now I'm going to wait for him to do what he's promised to do if I would just do what he tells me to do. And he said, come, and so I've come, and so now it's up to him to give you this rest and to give you this peace. But the second thing he said was, take my yoke upon you. And I explained to them that the yoke is that thing they would put on an ox so he could pull a plow. And so Jesus is basically saying, turn your life over to me. Let me begin to guide your life. Let me direct your life now. Let me have the reins. Take my yoke upon you. And then the third thing Jesus said was, learn of me. Now, why would Jesus want us to learn of him? Because he wants us to learn how much he actually loves us. The more you learn of him, the more you'll learn of his love for you. And the more you learn of his love for you, the more your heart is going to respond in love to him. How that love really breaks down the walls that we might seek to build up of resistance. It's awfully hard to resist that kind of love. And so Paul's prayer is that 
they might know the love of Christ, the length and the breadth, the depth and the height of this love of Christ. Which Paul acknowledges that it passes knowledge. It is through knowing the love of Christ manifested in his giving his life for our sins that we begin to comprehend the depths of God's love and the heights of God's love. Now when Paul is saying that you might know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, the word there know comes from the Greek root word genosko which is to know by experience. There's another Greek oedis which is to know intuitively. But this word is to know by experience so that you might experience this love of Christ. That you might know by experiencing it the love of Christ shed abroad in your heart. He wants you to experience that love. Now, the love that Jesus has for you, the, the length, the breadth, the depth, the height, so vast that we cannot bring it within the confines of our knowledge. It's, it's more than you can know. And then he prayed for them that they might be filled with the fullness of God. I like this. Because... Back in the Old Testament when Solomon was kneeling in prayer on that little raised platform before the people when they were dedicating the temple, he said, O oh God, O oh Lord, the heavens of heaven cannot contain thee. How much less this building that we have made. He acknowledged that God was vaster and greater than the universe. The universe itself is not large enough to contain God. In chapter 1, Paul speaks of the church as the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. God fills the entire universe. And then expands beyond it. The universe itself is not large enough to contain him. You can't go anywhere where God isn't. Isaiah speaks of him measuring or meeting out the heavens with the span. The span, the distance between your stretched out thumb and end of your finger, the end of your thumb, the span. <laughs> and, and that just boggles my mind when, if the astronomers are correct and our universe is some 15 billion light years in radius, and of course they've been expanding their estimates all the time. But if that be so, all it does is make my God that much bigger. <laughs> because he still measured it with a span. <laughs> the vastness of God. And yet he's praying that you might be filled with the fullness of God. The psalmist asked, Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Or if I descend and make my bed in hell, lo, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. I cannot escape the presence of God. He fills the universe. 
And yet Paul is praying that they might be filled with the fullness of God. No wonder, after having made these requests, Paul then sort of puts a little benediction on things. And he said, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. We've, we've quoted that scripture many times, but in the context, it's interesting. It's, the context is Paul's prayer that God will do some impossible things for them. That they might know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So that they might know something that you really can't know. And that they might be filled with the fullness of God of which the universe in all of its vastness is, is not capable. He fills the universe. Heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. They're not big enough. But may you be filled with the fullness. Now unto him who is able. And therein lies, of course, one of the keys to faith. Abraham, we are told in Romans chapter 4, did not consider the difficulties or the problems, the impossibility of the situation. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. But being strong in the faith, he gave glory to God. And then that fourth point, knowing that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. He was able. I know that God is able. Now you see, our problems so often rise by measuring the situation with our ability, with our limited strength, with our limited capacities. And as I am looking at the problem, looking at the situation in light of my capacities, I'm prone to faint. But if I will look at them in light of God's capacity, It is nothing, O oh Lord, for you to help with many or with few. King Asa prayed when faced with an impossible odds as far as the enemy was concerned. Ethiopians coming with a million men and hundreds of chariots. And he called upon God and said, Lord, it's nothing for you to help with many or with few. Those that have no strength. Lord, it doesn't matter to you. It was Jonathan that said, it's nothing for you to help with many or few, but that's uh, the same idea. God, if you want to work, you don't need a lot of people. All you need is one. One person to work through. God and you make a majority in any battle. As Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? And so he's prayed for some radical things, humanly speaking, impossible things. But yet I'm asking God. He said to the prophet, behold, I am God. Is there anything too hard for me? Difficulty must always be measured by the capacity of the agent doing the work. And when God is the agent doing the work, talk of difficulty is absurd. So the important thing is to get your eyes off the problem, the situation that is overwhelming you and causing you to sink. And to get your eyes upon God and His Tremendous power, strength, ability. Now unto him who is able. 
able to what? Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Those people who really accomplish things for the Lord are people who believed in God's ability. They weren't confident in themselves or in their ability. As Paul looked at all of the problems of the ministry, all of the things that he faced as a minister, the pressures, the problems, he said, and who is sufficient for these things? Who can handle this? But then he answers his own dilemma and question, and he says, but our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of Christ. Now unto him who is able. Amaziah the king was going to go down to settle issues with the Edomites. He gathered together his army he didn't feel secure. And so he sent to the northern kingdom of Israel and he sent them a hundred talents and hired a hundred thousand men, mercenary soldiers, to come down and to join him in the invasion of Edom so that he felt now secure in the numbers. He had an army of 300,000, but he was insecure and felt they needed a little bit more power. So he hired the men of Israel. And the prophet came to him and he said, why have you hired them to help you? They're not walking with God. God's blessing isn't on them. Send them home because God is able to deliver Edom into your hand. And the prophet assured him of the ability of God. He said, well, what will I do then? You know, I've already paid them 100 talents. And he said, God is able to give you much more. Forget it, you know, just, you know, don't, don't look at that problem. God's able to give you a lot more than that. The three Hebrew children, when they were being threatened by Nebuchadnezzar and given one more opportunity at the sound of the music to bow down to this great idol that he had built in the plains of Dura. I love these young guys. They said, we are not even careful in how we answer you. They're not choosing their words very carefully to be politically correct. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. I mean, the God that we serve, <laughs> he's able. You see, those who did exploits for the Lord were those who believed in the ability of God. And they had their eyes upon God's ability rather than our weaknesses or our limitations. When the king was tricked into putting Daniel into the burning, I mean, into the lion's den, <laughs> and it, it's so picturesque, it, it, the king spent a restless night. Early in the morning, he came out and called down, and it said, in a lamentable voice. I, I love that. It's very picturesque. You can hear the voice of the king. Oh, Daniel. <laughs> Is the God that you serve able to deliver you? Oh, rest in peace, king. God is able. God came down. The angel of the Lord shot. But the ability of God. When Jesus was talking with the Jews and they were sort of flaunting their... Uh, being descendants of Abraham. 
Jesus said that God was able from the stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Later in Matthew's gospel, when the two blind men came to him, he asked him, do you believe that I am able to do this? Paul told the Corinthians that God was able to make all grace abound towards them. Paul said to Timothy that I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Men saw the ability of God. They focused on that. And so when you're faced with problems that are insurmountable, when you're faced with impossible situations, when there is no way out, then it's time to focus upon God's ability. Behold, I am God, he said. Is there anything too hard for me? The book of Hebrews tells us that because Jesus suffered temptation, he is able to help you in your hour of temptation. And then again in Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able to save unto the uttermost all who will come unto God by him. The ability to save. doesn't matter how far a person has gone in sin, how deep they have sunk in the mire. He is able. And finally in Jude, in that benediction, as Jude says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. I mean, talking about impossible things. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. You can't keep yourself from falling. We all of us are prone to fall. But he is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Whenever you feel weak, whenever you feel the tempter's snare and you feel like I don't have the strength to overcome this temptation. Focus on him. He is able to keep you from falling. He is able to help you because he was tempted. He knows what it's about and he's able to succor you in your time of temptation or to help you, to aid you. It's so glorious to know that when I am facing situations that are beyond my capacity to deal with and I don't know what to do and I don't have the answers and I'm in a dilemma and I'm conscious of my weakness and I can't see any way out. So comforting to know that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. You know, I, I love the superlatives of the New Testament. God isn't able to just do more than exceeding abundantly above. You know, that, it's one thing to say, well, God can do it, sure. Hey, he, he can do exceeding abundantly above. Oh, the Lord can give you peace. No, he gives you peace that passes human understanding. Oh, the Lord can fill your life with joy. No, it's a joy that's indescribable and full of glory. The superlatives. Oh, the superlative life in Christ. There's nothing like it. I wouldn't trade it for anything the world has to offer. Father, we thank you for your love that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, that we might be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height and to know the, the love of Christ. Fill us, Lord, with your fullness. And Father... Help us to stay focused, not upon 
our situations or our problems, but focused on you. And may we not look at issues in the light of our strength, but in the light of your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.